Well, good morning. It's good to see everyone here this morning. This morning's lesson is entitled, Little Red Riding Hood's Guide to Truth. Taking our text from Matthew 7, 15 to 20. You might think it's odd that we're going to use a fable or, or fairy tale to kind of be the, the binder of our lesson this morning. But throughout time, mankind has come up with parables or fables or storytelling in order to convey some kind of moral or some kind of truth. Jesus himself employed the use of telling parables, and uh, we can go back to the early Greeks. We can see even in, the, in, a, in Roman times, and especially in medieval times, we, there has always been those that used something of the fantastic, a fable or a fairy tale, to convey some kind of moral. Little Red Riding Hood, this particular story, has oral traditions that date back to the 14th century, that is our, the 1300s AD. But its earliest known writing is in 1697 by the works of a man by the name of Charles Perrault. In his notes in that first writing, he said that the moral that he intended for readers to get out of reading when he wrote down his version of Little Red Riding Hood is the moral is, is for girls not to talk to strangers. And he has Little Red Riding Hood die at the end. She, there is no saving her by the woodsman. There is no saving her at all. She is eaten by the wolf, just as her grandmother is. And throughout time, as this story has been told and retold in various media formations, the ending changes depending on the source. As we get into more modern retellings, we find that sometimes the wolf is the hero, and oftentimes, especially since the 60s with the advent of feminism, Little Red Riding Hood herself is often the hero, doesn't need saving by the woodsman, she saves herself, and in still other tellings, she herself is the wolf, or is a wolf. Sometimes they're, the wolf is the love interest. She turns into a werewolf, and the wolf is a werewolf, and they end up getting married. So the ending depend, changes depending on the source and what time period you're looking at. What I want us to be looking at, the, talking about this morning, is perhaps its most well-known form, and that is the way the Brothers Grimm told it in the early 1800s. This has become the most popular version, and many versions today that take some spin off of this incorporate elements from the Brothers Grimm. And the, ba the gist of their story is that Little Red Riding Hood is going through the forest to take food to her sick grandma. The big bad wolf meets her in the forest, and she naively tells him her destination. In fact, in the writing, they specifically state that she naively tells him her destination. This is a, a borrowing of Charles Perrault's version, where his whole point was for girls not to talk to strangers. She not only tells, talks to the big bad wolf, but then she tells him exactly where she's going. And when she tells him where she's going, he advises that she stop and pick some flowers, that flowers would make a great garnishment for her basket of food for the sick grandma. And he doesn't eat her right then because she's in the forest and there are a lot of woodsmen in that particular area. So he just tells her, you pick flowers and that'll make this an even better uh, basket to take to your grandma. So while she's distracted picking flowers off her, his suggestion, he races ahead to the destination she so conveniently gave to him and he devours grandma whole, dresses in her robe and cap and then waits in her bed for the little red riding hood to show up. So when she arrives, she ends up questioning him about his appearance. And in the Charles Perrault version, she actually climbs into the bed with the wolf as she begins questioning him about his appearance and is ultimately devoured whole too. But in the Brothers Grimm storytelling, this makes this that, that popular version, the woodsman arrives, cuts open the wolf, and rescues both the grandma and Little Red Riding Hood. What I want us to be looking at this story as to get some moral out of is as I was reading through as I was reading through this and contemplating on this, some kind of some truth struck out at me about the way Jesus talked about false teachers. And so if we're going to use this story today to talk about the wolf as the false teacher and Little Red Riding Hood as the naive person that listens to the falsehood that's being told and the woodsman's axe being the axe or the sword of truth as we can see in the scriptures that can deliver one from such falsehoods and lies. Jesus said in Matthew 7, 15 to 20, Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. In this story, Little Red Riding Hood saw that ravenous wolf not in sheep's clothing, but in her grandma's clothing. Something innocent, something familiar, something that she could cuddle up against and be safe. 
In the same sense, Jesus is talking about other sheep in the fold, seeing a ravenous wolf in sheep's clothing. That sheep is going to be familiar. It's going to smell familiar. It's going to look familiar. They're going to feel safe because it's something innocent. It's like them. But inwardly, it's a ravenous wolf. He says in verse 16, you'll know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles, are they? So every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then, you will know them by their fruits. Jesus said false prophets, or teachers, are ravenous wolves in sheep's clothing. What he's saying is they're going, to harm, they're going to appear harmless right up until the end, right until they destroy your soul. They can be known by their fruits if people will look and compare them to the truth. So when we read the story of Little Red Riding Hood, why did she get so close? One can tell a person from a wolf, right? This, especially this time of year, but just about any time of year, if you go to a pet store, you can find costumes that you can put on your pet. They have costumes for cats and dogs of various sizes, and it's a lot of fun to do that. But we all understand when we dress that animal up, no matter what the costume is, we don't say, oh, I almost mistook you for a normal family member. I almost mistook you for a person. We understand that that is a dressed up animal. And while it can be cute and fun and picture worthy, we don't mistake that dressed up animal for a person. We're able to tell the difference. Why did Little Red Riding Hood get so close? Well, why do so many people today act the same way in spiritual matters? We can tell truth from error. We're given the guidebook that Jesus gave his blood to establish the church, to preserve his word that we might know the difference between right and wrong. We can see the difference between truth and error. The answer is perhaps summed up. People want the error to be truth. They're not ready to confront perhaps the consequences that come with recognizing the difference between truth and error. Sometimes it's the consequence of our own family. You hear all the time people saying, well, I've, I was raised this way or I grew up into this church or I was born into this, this religion, whatever that religion is. And if I, if I convert, well, then I'm condemning my family. No, you're not condemning the family, you might say to that person. The Word of God can convert your family and convict them of the truth the same as it did to you and your heart. We don't see that as an excuse given in the first century. Or those 3,000 Jews on the day of Pentecost didn't say, this is the way we've always done it. We can't possibly listen to you, Peter, because we're going to go back to our homes and our families may not like it. No, they said, what do we do? And they were baptized. And they went back to their homes and we see the church spreading throughout the world. No, instead, people adopt the Little Red Riding Hood, what I call the Little Red Riding Hood Syndrome, in their attitudes to what is true and false in spiritual matters. They get too close. They ask the wrong questions, and they do the wrong thing. We're going to summarize this in two parts. We're going to talk about Little Red Riding Hood's approach to religion, or her guide to truth, in the first part, called Blind Acceptance. We want you to think about this. She got close because she came into her grandma's house and expected to see her grandma. She wanted to see her grandma and not confront the truth of what had just happened, what had obviously happened. And so this is a picture depicting Charles Perrault's version from 1697, where in his storytelling she climbed into the bed next to the wolf dressed as her grandma to then question him about his appearance. Why did she get so close? Well, while we can look at the story and say that's crazy, we see people doing the same thing today. Why do they get so close? They'll go into any particular church with any particular name on it, teaching any particular doctrine, and they want to see God. They expect to see God, and so they see Him in everything false that that group does and practice. There's a, there's a common phrase that's often used of getting into the Spirit. Oh, we went into this group, and the singing was just, we just got into the Spirit. You know, that's not a phrase we ever read of in the New Testament describing the experience that we have as Christians. But yet they go into a place and the, the energy is what's buzzing and they're like, we got into the Spirit. And so it must be right, the things that they're doing. Despite the fact that to generate that energy, oftentimes it's entertainment driven. Oftentimes it's doing what pleases men, not what is pleasing to God. 
the society we live in has adopted such a practice regarding the church. The false doctrines of salvation and end times have become cliches for movies and books. If you watch a movie that has anything to do with religion, oftentimes it's going to have one of two different cliches. One, the Catholic Church is going to be the source of authority for all things biblically related. Or, it's going to have a denominational approach where they're going to sing the cliches of the end times of premillennialism. And that is the authority for the church, and that will drive whatever the motive is behind the story. Most stories or movies involving religion will use the Catholic Church as their authority for doctrine. They'll use it for their authority for all things church-related. Why? It's not that they can't understand the truth. It's because the false doctrine is so permeated into our society that that is what has become commonly accepted as fact and as truth, rather than for people doing their own research. We read earlier in Matthew 15, 12 to 14. We started this is in Matthew chapter 15. The, Phar the Pharisees were telling Jesus he needed to bring his disciples in a check because they ate without washing their hands. But he says to them, he says to them in verse 3, Why do you yourselves transgress the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? He's saying washing their hands before they eat is a tradition. This wasn't a commandment of God. And here they are telling Jesus, you need to correct your disciples. Why do, they, why do you allow them to eat before they wash their hands? And he says, why do you transgress the law of God in order for it to keep your tradition? He says, God said, honor your father and mother. And he who speaks evil of father and mother is to be put to death. But you say... Whoever says to his father or mother, whatever I have that would help you has been given to God. He is not to honor his father or his mother. And by this you invalidated the word of God for the sake of your tradition. He says you're teaching something false in order for tradition. And here they're condemning him not on the basis of law, but on the basis of their tradition. So he says to them in verse 7, You hypocrites, rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you. Now, when Isaiah prophesied what he's about to quote, it was to the Jews of his day. What he's saying is, you have not changed. You are doing the same things as your forefathers did that caused the destruction of Jerusalem. So he says in verse 8, here he's quoting from Isaiah. This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far away from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men. There are a great number of people today that this condemnation would fall on. That they worship God. They believe that God is one God. They believe in Jesus. They even believe in the mission that he came to do. But they worship him in vain. Because rather than worship him according to law, they worship him according to their traditions. They worship him according to what they want to do. And so in verse 10, Jesus called the crowd to him and he said to them, Hear and understand. It is not what enters the mouth that defiles the man, but what proceeds out of the mouth, this defiles the man. And then what I have on the slide behind me is in verse 12. Knowing the context of why this confrontation happened. The disciples were, were kind of, you can see that by the, what we're about to read here in verse 12, they're a little apprehensive of what they just witnessed in this exchange between Jesus and the religious leaders. Verse 12, then the disciples came and said to him, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this statement? Jesus just called them false teachers. He just said they were experts at setting aside the law of God for their traditions. Yeah, they're going to be offended. And the disciples are all worried about that. And he says to them in verse 13, But he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father did not plant shall be uprooted. Let them alone. They're blind guides of the blind. And if a blind man guides a blind man, both will fall into a pit. So then, as I read earlier through verse 20, he explains what he's saying. That it, it doesn't matter whether they wash their hands before they eat. That's not what's going to make them wrong before God. What makes one wrong before God is going back to verses 3 through 7. When he says they've set aside the law of God for the sake of their traditions. So what we read from this passage. Is Jesus said of false teachers and then those who follow them. The blind leading the blind. And both fall into the pit. Were they blind following the blind out of necessity? Because there was no other choice? No, they had the words of, of the law. They had the words of the prophets, the words of Moses. They had the, the will of God in front of them. But yet they chose to set those aside for their traditions. So 
what we see is false teachers and doctrines can be known from truth. Why do people follow? Why do the blind follow the blind? Well, I think part of the answer is found in 2 Timothy 4, 3 through 4. 2 Timothy 4, 3 through 4. One of the reasons Paul tells Timothy in verses 1 and 2 that he is to preach the word in season and out of season. He's to be ready to rebuke and reprove and exhort with great patience and instruction. He says, verse 3, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires, and will turn away their ears from the truth, and will turn aside to myths. What Paul is telling Timothy, that ears, that, that phrase, that idiom of your ears tickled, he's saying they want to listen to what they want to hear. And so they want to listen to what they want to hear so badly, they're going to find teachers that are willing to teach what they want to hear that's in accordance with their desires. Notice what the mo their motive is. The teaching is in accordance with their desires, not their desire for truth. Part of the problem, then, is people listen to what they want to hear. And this isn't anything new. Paul said this was going to happen. He said this was going to happen within the faith, that they're going to no longer endure sound doctrine, but they're going to want to grab teachers and gravitate to teachers that are going to teach in accordance with their desires. And so you see, just like the Pharisees in Jesus' day, mankind has gone the full circle. Just as they set aside the law of God for their traditions, mankind sets aside the law of God for their own desires. And they're going to find somebody that's going to teach in accordance with their desires. There are those who blindly accept what is said and taught as truth. In 2 Corinthians 4, 3 through 4, Paul describes another group of people. He says, And even if our gospel is veiled, it's veiled to those who are perishing, in whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving, so they may not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. What he's saying is there's those who do not seek, seek the truth, but they accept lies as truth. And there are those who intentionally are blind for various reasons. Some of these reasons are they, they like the, the speaker. They like the message better than another message. They like the perks and benefits, et cetera, et cetera, and on and on it goes. I had a friend who did not have the right to remarry after she and her husband divorced. But she found this other guy, and they were going to get married. And I had this discussion with her, and she said, Oh yeah, I know, I know, I know what Jesus said. But I left the, I went to a different church, I went to this community church, and the preacher there, she referred to him as pastor, but the preacher there, he told me that it's okay. And so, and that he'll even marry us. And so guess where she switched her, her attendance to? She went to the community church because he says, oh no, Jesus, what Jesus said doesn't matter. Irreconcilable differences is grounds for remarriage because God wants you to be happy. And if you're happy, God is happy. And so I'll be happy to marry you. And so she pretty much left the church. And she married the guy that she had no right to marry because somebody told her it was okay. Could she know the truth from error? Oh yeah, she actually knew the truth from error. But what she really desired was for someone to tell her what she really wanted to hear. And when she found that, that's where she gravitated to. That's where she went. She made herself intentionally blind because she liked that message better than the message from our Lord. Blindly accepting what is false as truth will lead to eternal punishment. Jesus said that blind following the blind, both will fall into the pit. Therefore, both the false teacher and those who follow will be condemned. They will perish. And it didn't have to happen that way. We should not blindly follow because we can tell truth from error. The second category we want to put this in, in this story of Little Red Riding Hood, is what I call she got lost in the details. So here she is questioning the wolf as to his appearance. Why does he look different from Grandma? So once she got close to the wolf, she questioned him. And by the time she got to his teeth, well, it was too late. He knew the gig was about up, and so he devoured her. 
Many people today also get lost in the details rather than see the big picture of falsehood. Some will question when looking for a church, what do you offer? Not, is what you teach the truth. Do you teach truth? Do you teach from the scriptures and not from man's traditions? No, oftentimes the question is, what do you offer? When they ask such questions, their concern is not for truth, but is for benefits. What they're saying is, what can I get out of it? And so they'll seek the congregation that offers the free daycare. They'll seek the congregation that offers the free TV at the end of the year for 100% attendance. Yeah, those places exist. They'll, they'll seek for the place that has the barista with their favorite cup of coffee in the front. They'll seek for their own desires. They'll seek for their benefits that they can get out of it. But a congregation can be compared to the scriptures and see if it is the church that one ought to attend. If it is the church that Jesus died to save. You see, people get lost in details. Congregations can be seen as true or false by their founder, by their names, by their doctrines, by what they practice. And the church of God, we can see, was built by Jesus in Matthew 16, 18. He says, I also say to you that you're Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower. The church built by Jesus wears his name, Romans 16, 16. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the churches of Christ greet you. What he's saying is the churches that belong to Christ. We also see in other places, uh, Acts chapter 20, verse 28 is another good place, where it's referred to as the church of God. Again, it's a church that belongs to God. There's ownership there. Practices by his authority. In Ephesians 5, 24, Jesus said, But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. As we talked about many months ago, that the relationship between husband and wife is the physical manifestation of the spiritual relationship between Christ and the church. That the church is to be subject to Jesus. How can we do that when we say, well, this makes us happy, and so this is what we're going to do, when there's clear direction in the way we ought to be going? Colossians 1.18 says, He is the head of the church. And the church that Jesus died to save abides in His teaching. In John 8.31, so Jesus was saying to those Jews who believed in him, If you continue in my word, then you're truly disciples of mine. If you go to John 15, 4-10, and 2 John 9, we can see that we are to abide in the teaching of Christ. 2 John 9 says, The one that goes too far and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. But the one who abides in the teaching of Christ has both the Father and the Son. So we see that it's not just a matter of opinion whether or not one abides in the, the doctrine of Christ and it's important or not, we see that our souls depend on it. If one no longer abides in the teaching or the doctrine of Christ, it says God does not have him. He, do, he no longer has God. And Paul told the Gentile Christians in Ephesus, in Ephesians chapter 2, their state before they came to know Christ. That without Christ, that means they were also without God, and without God means without hope. Without hope means they were lost and dead in their sins. So one who no longer abides in the teaching of Jesus, who no longer has the Father, goes back to the same state they were in before they ever knew Christ. Without hope and without God. See, denominations don't fit the qualification for truth. Differing founders, differing names, differing practices, differing authorities, differing doctrines, even among those with the same name. They have differing doctrines and practices. But rather than see something false, people like Little Red Riding Hood get lost in the details. My, but what? Fill in the blank. My, but what big hearts they have. They feed the poor of their community. When over and over from the church treasury we see the saints provided for needy saints. The church took care of its own, not the feeding of the world. My, but what big youth programs they have. When they explain, when they exclaim such sentiments as that, they're saying the focus is on entertainment. My, but what big youth programs? My, but what big numbers they have? Well, that many people can't be wrong. I once had someone tell me that the way Joel Osteen filled the, the stadium in Houston, how could that many people be wrong? Well, that many people can be wrong. Jesus was talking to crowds of people when he said, you hypocrites, in Matthew 23. Mostly directed at the religious leaders, but all those who also followed them. He also directed his attention to the crowds that followed him when he said, You come to me seeking for a sign, not for the things that I have to say. That many people can be wrong. 
What about the multitude that were gathered there on the day of Pentecost? Jesus says, you put to death the Christ by the hands of godless men. Peter was saying, that many people can be wrong. And 3,000 people out of that multitude came to their senses and did something about it. Oftentimes when they look at a church, they'll say, my, but what good speaking they have. They have a very good speaker. And while there's nothing inherently wrong with that, I would, I would have loved to have listened to Paul. By just his writings, we, I, I have in my imagination, he was a very good speaker. There's nothing wrong with that per se, but to follow somebody simply because they're a good speaker is for the wrong reasons. And we see that happen all the time. I was a member of a congregation that after we moved away, and I looked up to the preacher there, I looked up to him and respected him a whole lot. But he split that congregation from error. And when he split the congregation, half of it went, half of it stayed. Why did the half that stayed? They stayed because they had preacheritis. He can't be wrong. He's so and so. He has to be right. No, he was wrong. And he split the congregation in half because of it. But people stayed because, well, he's a very good speaker rather than seeking for someone else who's also a good speaker of truth. My, but what a more convenient message. Once saved, always saved, etc., etc. As in the case of my friend, who I, that it's personal experience I had, that she liked the message at the community church better because it allowed for her to have the life that, then she, want, that the, she then wanted. It was a more convenient message than listening to what Jesus had to say in Matthew 19. To have someone say, oh, irreconcilable differences are okay to remarry from. Or the people that teach once saved, always saved. What a convenient message. Have you ever thought about what that means? When people finally get that into their heads of what that's saying, they don't attend services anymore. I remember listening to a preacher on the radio once saying, talking, bemoaning the fact that their attendance had been down. But then in his message, he's talking about how you can't lose your salvation. So once you realize that, why would you attend? Once you get that in your head, you're going to say, well, I can do whatever I want to do, and I'm going to go to heaven the same as those that attend every Sunday, that attend the services, that live godly lives. I can go and live however I see fit. Because the preacher said, once saved, always saved. See, that's a real convenient message, and so you can see why the multitudes buy into it. Because what it leads to is I can live in whatever debauchery state that I want to and I can't lose my salvation. Despite the clear warnings in the scripture over and over and over again to see to it that we are walking in a worthy manner of the gospel. To see that we do not fall away. To see that we do not go too far and abide outside the doctrine of Christ. Some people will say, my, but what good works they do. Speaking of the church. Religious organizations, even charities, they should have nothing to do with. And the list goes on and on and on. Because they see, my, but what good works they do. And so they get close, they get involved, and they participate. Despite the fact that Jesus said about such things in Matthew 7, 21 to 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name cast out demons, and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Jesus stated that the ones who do the will of his Father will enter into heaven. That means that his, Father will, his Father's will can be obeyed, and it can be followed. And Jesus said it must be if you want to enter into heaven. He further said those who think that they're doing good works but are actually outside his authority will not enter into heaven but instead will be eternally punished. In Matthew 25 verse 46 he said speaking to those on his left these will go away into eternal punishment. Getting lost in the details to the point we don't see what is false till it's too late will result in the ultimate demise. The losing of one's soul in hell for all eternity. Matthew 25, 46. These will go away into eternal punishment. In Matthew 25, 41, when he first starts talking to those on his left, he says, These, you depart from me, you accursed ones, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. 
But luckily for us, the Brothers Grimm told a story that there is kind of redemption for the naive little girl and even for her grandma. And so that's why I said we're focusing in on the popularized version by the, Grimm, the Brothers Grimm. The third section we want to talk about is cut off. In the end of the fairy tale or the fable, the woodsman with an axe rescued Little Red Riding Hood and her grandma from the belly of the wolf. In fact, as the story goes, they, he cuts the wolf in half. The wolf goes into kind of a, a coma. And rather than finish him off, the, the story goes that they fill his belly with rocks, sew him back up. And when he wakes up, he goes for a drink of water and he falls into the well and that's how he dies. But the bottom line is, with his axe, he slices the wolf open and he rescues both Grandma and Little Red Riding Hood because, as the story said, he swallowed them whole. The point I want us to get from this end of the story is that there is hope for those, not only those that are the blind leading the blind, but just as there are is hope for the blind following the blind. The axe, or in this case, the sword of truth, as we see in the scriptures, will rescue people from falsehoods and lies. In Hebrews 4.12, it said the sword of truth is powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It can judge thoughts and intentions. In John 8, 31 to 32, Jesus said the truth can set one free. He said you can know it and you can do it. That means you can obey it. And the truth will set you free. And truth will either set free or destroy. When Jesus says in John 12, 48, that his words will judge mankind in the last day. That truth, his words, that we can know in this lifetime, will either set us free or will be there as our judge at the end day, the end of time, and will destroy us. <coughs> in the scriptures, especially in the New Testament, the imagery of an axe and the sword both are used as the truth delivering one from error. In Matthew 3.10, John the Baptist said to the Jews there with him, The axe is already laid at the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. He's saying the axe is already at the root of the tree. If it does not bear good fruit, it's going to be cut down and thrown into the fire. Jesus later says the kingdom was removed from the Jews and given to people who produced the fruit of it. And he prophesied that 70 AD would happen where the axe swung and the tree came crashing down when Jerusalem was destroyed and the temple was burned. Jesus said in Matthew 7, 19, Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. John the Baptist said it, and he said the axe was already at the root. Jesus said it's going to happen. And then he said of false teachers and those who follow the false teaching, in Matthew 15, 13, Every plant which my heavenly Father did not plant shall be uprooted men and women that follow different teachings for various reasons. Because it's convenient, they like the speaker, they like the message better, whatever the reason is, if it's not from God, it will be uprooted. And they'll find themselves not entering into heaven as they might expect, but entering into an eternal fire. It is important to know who or what we're following. Just as the axe can save it can destroy. Matthew 7, 19, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Those who teach and those who follow error for whatever reasons will be cut off. The axe in the story can be looked at as the sword of truth as we can see in the scriptures as well as the axe that John the Baptist spoke of. And it can rescue people from the error. It can rescue people from the error of their ways, whether they're the ones teaching the false doctrine or whether they're the ones following it. And we have seen men and women with honest hearts that have turned from such things and embraced the truth. There are many who in the end will not have the happy ending as in the Brothers Grimm fable. Theirs will be the story as in the original story where there is no redemption, where the heroine or the little girl dies. There are those who will see the truth too late when they stand before Christ and are sentenced to their eternal home in hell. Matthew 7, 22 to 23, Matthew 25, 41 and 46. It's important for us to know. Truth can be known just as error can be known and we can see the difference. In John 15, verse 6, in John 15, verse 6, it says, If anyone does not abide in me, he's thrown away as a branch and dries up. And they gather them and cast them in the fire. 
and they're burned. Those not abiding in Jesus will be cast away. John 15, verse 10. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. Those keeping Christ's commandments abide in Him, and they have His love. If we don't blindly accept something as truth, if we don't get caught up in the details of what should be clearly false, we won't be cut off. 2 Timothy 2.15 says we ought to be diligent or to study to show ourselves a workman that does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing or accurately handling the word of truth. That means we will be, we will be approved if we know the difference. If we can rightly divide truth from error. If we can see what is the word of God and what is the tradition or the commandments of men. So my admonition this morning is don't let Little Red Riding Hood be your guide in spiritual matters or even determining the truth. Don't have blind acceptance. Don't get lost in the details. And don't be cut off. But rather, turn to the truth. Embrace it. And let the truth set you free. If you're not a Christian this morning, you need to be. To repent and be baptized into His name. What if you're here as a Christian and, and are not living the way that you ought? Now is the time to see that. Now is the time to make correction. To look at your life in balance of what the Scripture says. And make the corrections that might be necessary. The prescription for you this morning is to repent and be renewed. And if we can assist you in any of these things, if you're subject to invitation in any way, come forward now let it be known while we stand and sit.